Throughout the history of mankind, there has not been as many steps as crucial as the domestication of animals. As it is widely known, one of the first creatures to undergo this process was the wolf, and the result was the creation of a new species. Scientists placed the domestication of dogs around 15,000 BCE, though some archaeological remains dating between 36,000 to 20,000 BCE prove that the cohabitation of men and proto-dogs started in a far earlier period. Throughout the generations, this coexistence led to changes in diet, the body, and the temperament of the animals, resulting in the creation of different breeds best suited for completion of different tasks. Humans had become masters of this kind of manipulation, shaping dogs to perform important duties that went from hunting to shepherding and guarding. One population in particular stands out for its strong dependence on the cooperation with dogs, the Inuit. Inuit is an umbrella term used to describe a variety of hunter-gatherer people spread across the vast territories of the North American Arctic each with their differences, but all united with the deeply rooted presence of the dog in both their material and spiritual world. For them, the dog not only constituted an invaluable ally in the struggles of daily life, but it represented a legitimate and active member of society, as well as an important element of their mythology and their religion. Thanks to the close cooperation between the two species, the Inuit and their ancestors were able to colonize one of the most inhospitable landscapes of our planet, giving birth to a rich and diversified culture. All of the debate of how the first Americans migrated to North America is still ongoing, scientists generally place the when between 15,000 and 20,000 years ago. Towards the end of the Pleistocene, as the sea level significantly lower due to the Quaternary Glaciation, these pioneer populations were able to cross from Asia into the Americas through Beringia, making their way south to more hospitable lands. The territories of the Arctic didn't witness a settling of permanent colonies until much later around 7,000 years ago when another migration from Siberia spread across the region. This population is known to archaeologists as the Paleo-Inuit. These first Arctic settlers are classified by scientists in chronologically distinct groups the last of which was named the Dorset culture, after Cave Dorset in Nunavut, where the first evidence of its existence was found. This maritime population occupied the coastal and insular lands of what are now northern Canada and Greenland for more than 1,500 years, but was gradually replaced by another, more successful one who migrated again from Siberia. The Thule people were skilled seafarers who originated in Northeast Asia and crossed the Bering Strait to first settle the Alaskan coast around 200 BCE. The designation Thule originates from the location of Thule in northern Greenland, where archaeological remains of the people were first found. The characteristic of this population is a strong maritime adaptation demonstrated by the invention of the kayak and the umiak, which are different types of boats ingeniously designed for the transportation of people and goods both on water and on land. Various other innovations made by the Thule people allowed for the hunting of sea mammals to be more efficient. The Thule culture is divided by researchers and stages representative of the various traditions experienced as it expanded over time. The Old Bering Sea is considered to be the first phase, going from around 400 BCE to 600 CE, as testified by the several archaeological sites found on the coasts of the Chukchi Sea and the Bering Strait. Typically their sites consist of large mounds and middens, which are old dumps for domestic waste. Or they consist of cemeteries with a vast number of graves, not uncommonly decorated with whale bones and driftwood. It is specifically here where we find the first evidence of a complex and ritualized relationship between dogs and humans in this geographical area. In regions like Siberia, archaeological records indicate that humans and dogs had already been cohabitating some 15,000 years ago, and by 7,500 years ago, when people started to bury their dead in cemeteries, their relationship was already strongly developed as demonstrated by the several burial sites found across the area, where it is not unusual to find graves specifically for dogs, not unlike those of their fellow humans. For example, in Ushki, 
a site in the peninsula of Kamchatka, which coincidentally is the oldest one dating back to some 17,000 to 14,000 years ago. Archaeologists found a dog skeleton which was entombed under the floor of a house, alongside ochre and several stone tools. The grave was created in the same manner as two other graves for children in the same community. Animals that were buried like people, not uncommonly laid with tools or objects such as jewelry like their human companions, would be mourned upon their death, suggesting that they were not merely living technologies exploited by people in accomplishing tasks, but rather were significant social actors for humans who they lived with. It is unclear when ancient dogs first moved into the Americas, but it is certain that they accompanied men on several different migrations starting in the late Pleistocene and early Holocene as there is no evidence of independent domestication in the continent. Nevertheless, hardly any of these migrations led to a permanent settling in the North American Arctic. As a matter of fact, prior to 500 CE, the presence of dogs in this area was scarce and their archaeological remains negligible. Some are found in small numbers in house and midden contexts, confirming the cohabitation of the two species, but revealing little to no interesting data. It is only with the old Bering Sea culture that we begin to bear witness to a more complex relationship between humans and dogs. Significant in this aspect is the cemetery of Ipuatak, a site dating from 500 to 900 CE located in the now Cape Hope in northern Alaska. Here we observe the first dog burials of the area. In Ipuatak, researchers brought to light a particular grave featuring dog skulls reassociated depositions in which one or two dogs accompanied human remains and one true dog burial. In truth, dog skulls, mandibles, and teeth are a relatively common find in cemeteries of the same period of both sides of the Bering Strait, but their presence alongside human remains and sometimes with analogous bones of bear, walrus, seal, and beluga indicates that they were curated specifically for the purpose of deposition in human graves. This suggests that dog parts might have held some form of ritual significance. Equally interesting, if not more so, are the burials 131, 137, and 132. The first one contained a dog skeleton lying along the left hip of a human. The second one featured an adult man flanked by two dogs, one on each side. The third one consisted of an adult woman holding an infant with a dog's body placed alongside her right leg, with its head rested on her thigh while the hindquarters covered her feet. Finally, there was Burial 109, which featured a complete dog skeleton interred in a tomb-like log structure with its head oriented to the west, exactly as in the human burials. This tomb did not include any human remains nor artifacts, but it is a mirrored image of human graves elsewhere in the cemetery, suggesting that this particular animal was clearly distinct from the others and that it held some kind of special significance, deserving an unusual investment of time, energy, and resources. Albeit Burial 109 was clearly an archaeological find unique in its genre for its period and its place, therefore considered an exception and not the rule. Researchers agree to interpret that the unique dog burials of Ipuatak suggest a parallel treatment of human and non-human animals in death as evidence that the species held similar ontological positions. Of course, without further evidence, this interpretation must remain conjectural. The second stage of the Thule culture called the Bernerk culture dating from 700 to 1000 CE is when we witness the gradual but radical transformation of dogs from commensal species to a cultural keystone. This change is best noticeable during the classic Thule period between 1000 to 1450 CE, when humans and dogs developed and refined the skills, technologies, and cultural norms that enabled them to rapidly colonize the North American Arctic. A signature innovation of this period was the use of dog traction for sleds, which up until that moment used to be pulled by hand, especially by women for the transportation on sea ice of meat, whale fat, and boats. This novelty increased the number of tasks a sled could be used for and allowed dogs to help humans all year round in a variety of jobs other than hunting, which essentially has always been their sole function. Now, dogs could aid men in dragging heavy loads for greater distances and longer periods of time, 
both on ice in winter, upstream in spring, and inland in summer, enabling them to considerably expand their hunting grounds and follow the migrations of big game and marine mammals. It also allowed them to trade on a larger scale and to settle on the coasts of the far north of Canada, replacing the Dorset culture and to colonize the entirety of Greenland. The use of canine traction was accompanied by changes in sled technology and new forms of material culture, such as the creation of the harness and the whip. In particular, the use of the latter can provide us with information for imagining what the relationship between humans and dogs might have looked like. Sure enough, osteological evidence indicates that many dogs suffered injuries due to violent trauma of artificial origin and several archaeological finds highlight the use of dogs as a source of meat and raw materials for the making of tools and ornaments. Some argue that the severe discipline and punishments endured by the animals and their use as food would have prevented the Thule from establishing social bonds with them. But it must be emphasized that the treatment and use of dogs appear to be diversified between regions and historical periods, and that such practices reflect its peculiar position in the cosmology of these people, which we will discuss later. The decline of the Thule culture was marked, above all, by the climate change of the Little Ice Age, which took place between 1400 and 1600 CE. Of course, this event was not a real ice age, nor did it have an impact on the whole planet. It was rather a regional scale occurrence affecting various parts of the globe and resulting in a drop in temperatures of about 0.6 degrees Celsius. A modest change that nevertheless had a great effect on the populations of the Arctic. In fact, the Thule people, who used to circulate almost exclusively north of the Arctic tree line, which is the ecological boundary that divides the polar from the subpolar climate zone and whose livelihood greatly depended on whaling at open sea they found themselves having to drastically reduce the duration of the hunting season due to the growth of the sea ice and the lack of whales and other big prey. The consequent impoverishment of the Thule's diet and the not indifferent reduction of the availability of raw materials necessary for the construction of tools and homes, together with the inability to use kayak and umiak, forced the Thule to move away from the Arctic and adopt a semi-nomadic lifestyle. The cultural changes that these people underwent to survive is what led them to evolve into the current Inuit. As a matter of fact, the links between the Thule and the Inuit are both biological, cultural, and linguistic. It is during the same period that these populations began to trade with the First Nations of North America, and later with European settlers, with whom they had their first contact with in the late 16th century. The first Europeans to venture into the Arctic were mainly explorers determined to map out terra incognita, and by the time that the now Inuit moved back to their homeland, European whalers and fur traders roamed the vast ice-covered lands. The Inuit were introduced to new materials and technologies imported from the old continent and in the span of a few decades, they were able to replace stone and bone with iron and wood and learn how to use fabrics, nails, glass, and so on. These contacts and exchanges, however, greatly damaged the lifestyle of the natives. Excessive hunting by the European whalers caused a drastic decline in the large cetacean population, which consequently brought such hunters to turn to smaller marine mammals like porpoises, belugas, and seals, all of which were extremely important animals for the nutrition of the Inuit, who by this time had become increasingly dependent on the new materials imported by the foreigners. Having found themselves outcompeted by the newcomers, the Inuit turned to the Arctic fox fur trade, a product which was highly sought after in European fashion. Meeting the massive demand of fox pelts required the use of particular traps and techniques that obligated the native population to divide into small groups scattered throughout large areas. This resulted in social disintegration which dismembered the traditional groups and greatly reduced the potential for cooperation which was essential in the Arctic. Furthermore, the contact with Europeans also favored for the spread of new illnesses that caused numerous deaths among the natives, who also had to rely entirely on the outsiders for the cure. Therefore, by the end of the 19th century, many if not all aspects of Inuit life were regulated by the colonizers and especially the fur traders, who however did not yet occupy the lands of the far north. As we have little to no Inuit written records from this period, 
Most of what will now be discussed comes from the testimony of these colonizers, be they explorers, anthropologists, or traders. Despite all of what was said before, up until the first half of the 20th century, the Inuit managed to lead a life relatively similar to their ancestors, keeping up traditions and day-to-day -day practices dating back centuries. A key aspect of this way of life were the dogs. Just like their ancestors, the Thule, the Inuit held a deep relationship of codependency with their animal companions. They relied on them for transportation and hunting, among other tasks. Due to their importance, dogs were closely observed and cared for since birth to ensure that they would grow to become strong and productive members of society. Even though some people practice a certain level of selection, letting female dogs occasionally mate with wolves to strengthen the line, dog breeding was not particularly important for the Inuit. However, once the puppies were born, great care was taken to ensure a healthy upbringing. In the first few weeks of their lives, Mothers and puppies were allowed inside the homes to keep warm and were given caribou hides when this wasn't possible. Once weaned, puppies were usually fed two to three times a day, usually with broth or preferably pieces of meat. They knew it believed that puppies who were fed only once per day would develop a ferocious appetite as adults and would need more food to keep fit. Women and children were charged to look after and care for puppies in these first stages. Girls in particular were responsible for the majority of tasks as it was seen as a sort of training for their future job as mothers. It was not uncommon to see little girls carry puppies in their parkas as the adults would do with newborns. To ensure that the puppies would grow up to be strong and useful dogs, it was customary to help their growth with practices that were believed to create better specimens. For example, a puppy could be taken by the front and back legs and stretched so it would grow quickly. After each meal, one could blow air into the rear end of a puppy to make sure that, as an adult, it would suffer less from hunger. One could also rub animal fat on the puppy's paws to make sure that its pads would never get injured. It was believed that by feeding a pregnant female an owl's regurgitation, she would have become a good mother with big puppies. Another belief was that by sporadically sucking air out of a dog's nose, it would develop an excellent sense of smell. Some populations still believe to this day that feeding puppies a certain amount of bear meat will make them more aggressive towards those animals and therefore better hunters. It was also quite common to give dogs amulets to improve their abilities. A seal's tooth hung on a dog's neck was believed to grant the animal a powerful bite during fights. The tendon of a caribou's front limb fashioned as a necklace would have gifted health and strength to a puppy. And finally, the shell of a particular type of snail attached to a dog's collar would have given them the ability to sense the approaching bad weather. No formal training was given to dogs in their first year, but through experience they learned not to steal people's food, eat inside the house, or destroy objects and tools. All things that they could be punished or beaten for. Once they reached the age of one, sled pulling training began. Puppies were already acquainted with the harness, but only after a year were they strong enough to carry and pull weight. Women were tasked with training individual dogs through pulling exercises for which they could be warded with praise or cuddles, but never food. When it was believed that the animal was ready, it was introduced to a previously formed pack and positioned behind a mature dog. The most fearful dogs were considered the best to form a team because they were more submissive to the leader. The latter were usually the strongest and more energetic dog of the pack and it was able to keep all the other members at bay. It had the most important job on the team and it was the only one trained to respond to the driver's commands, both vocal and gestural. Lead dogs were selected at a very early age on the basis of particular physical and behavioral features, regardless of sex. They underwent a different training from the others and they were supervised by both men and women. Given their importance, lead dogs were often given special care and better food, along with being allowed in the house. They would have been the closest thing that the Inuit ever had to our idea of modern pets. The dog's main function was to pull the sled on snow and ice for movements related to communication, camp relocation, and especially hunting. A well-trained team was capable of traveling long distances carrying heavy loads. For example, a pack of six dogs could haul a load of 115 kilograms for 80 kilometers in a day. 
a team of 14 dogs could cover more than 160 in less than 24 hours, and a team of 13 dogs could even transport over short distances even 700 kilograms of meat. The shape and size of sleds could vary considerably depending on their function and the geographical area they were used in, but their composition was generally the same, wood and ivory. Maritime people sourced wood by salvaging logs and branches transported by the rivers or the sea and completed the construction with bones from game, especially whales. Dogs were equipped with a pulling harness made out of animal hides, usually caribou or seal and they were attached to the sled through ropes and leather straps. There were mainly two types of towing, which are still in use today. The single line and fan hitching. In the first case, the dogs were arranged one behind the other with the leader at the head of the formation, and alternatively secured to the left and to the right of the center rope that connected them to the vehicle. This was the most efficient method of pulling a sled over long distances, with heavy weights, where the snow is high or the path is narrow. In the second case, each dog was tied to the sled individually, giving the team a chance to fan out. In this way, the dogs were more autonomous in their movement and the weight was distributed over a wider surface area. The fan hitching was the most popular method among the Inuit because it was the most convenient for going hunting as the dogs could quickly be released to chase after prey and traverse the ice flow. Especially when the ice was thin. In both cases, during long trips, it was still possible that the driver or passenger would walk alongside or in front of the pack. In summer, during the short period of the year when land wasn't covered in snow or ice, the maritime populations had no use for dogs, but those who lived far inland got help from the animals in transporting meat and equipment by making the animals wear leather saddlebags. For a daily journey of about 40 kilometers, dogs were usually loaded with no more than 15 kilograms of weight. Although this was a much lighter load than what they were used for carrying during the winter, it was not recommended to overwork the dogs as they would not make a good draft animal in the following season. Even after the introduction of rifles, the dog has always revealed itself as an excellent aid to the hunter, who regards the animal as an extension of his senses. The most important skill of a dog was considered to be tracking the holes in the sea ice where seals lean out to breathe. One or two dogs were usually separated from the rest of the team and untied from the sled so they could track the breathing holes and point them out to the hunter. Once the prey was spotted, the dog would walk away as to trick the seal while the hunter prepared for the actual kill. Some populations used dogs to hunt musk oxen and bighorn sheep, but such prey inhabited a more inland area and was relatively rare. On the other hand, hunting polar bears was much more common and for this practice a whole team was used. Once a specimen was spotted, the dogs were released to chase after the animal and bring it to exhaustion while pushing it towards the hunter, who would make the kill as the dogs kept it distracted. This technique was highly affected and it continued to be used even after the introduction of rifles. Dogs were not directly trained for hunting, but they learned by watching and following the more experienced dogs. The number of dogs owned by a household differed a lot based on the geographical area. With an average of one to two dogs among inland populations, up to six in exceptional cases, but never more, and eight or ten to a maximum of sixteen among those who lived by the sea. According to the Inuit, during a day of work a dog could eat as much as a human which was between two and three kilograms of meat. That meant that the hunter's energy had to be spent on procuring food for himself and his family as much as for his dogs. Thanks to the hunting of marine mammals, coastal populations could count on a more abundant supply of meat than those living inland and therefore could afford to feed an entire pack of dogs with less difficulty. The dog's eating habits varied substantially between the seasons. In summer, when they were almost useless, dogs were not given neither food nor water except in minimal amounts and were therefore left free to roam and find nourishment on their own. Still very dependent on men, dogs continued to frequent the settlements, feeding on anything they could find such as small animals, vermin, seafood, scraps of human food, and other waste. 
Leather equipment like harnesses, whips, and clothes, and even excrement were eaten. In winter, the situation was quite different. Dogs were usually kept tied to pickets when they were not in use, but their masters took great care of their nutrition. They fed them several times a week or even daily, and they made sure that their diet was as varied as possible. They felt that dogs could get tired of eating the same thing all the time. My dog would probably agree with this statement. It was believed that a dog should be adequately rewarded for its work and therefore fed the same food as humans. Dogs were given parts of the game that men considered less palatable, such as organs like the spleen, lungs, fat, blood, entrails, and almost all the parts of the walrus, which wasn't considered particularly tasty. In cases of emergency, both dogs and humans could resort to the consumption of caribou droppings mixed with oil. To ensure that the dogs remained healthy, it was customary to take one to two days off during a strenuous journey so that the animals would recover their strength. In the event that a dog got injured or became ill, it would have been transported on the sled for the rest of the way. Other care practices might have included the crafting of a special kind of footwear designed to protect the dog's paws in extremely cold conditions. The dog was considered a valuable economic asset, and a man was often judged by the number, strength, stamina, and size of his animals. The head of the household was formally considered the owner of the dogs, as well as of the sled, the umiak, and the house, and thus was able to dispose of them as he pleased. But realistically, these assets were owned jointly by every member of the family who shared their care and maintenance. A rich person was considered to be the one that owned a surplus of assets or an above average amount of dogs. More often than not, however, the opposite was true, and a family did not have enough food to afford to keep enough dogs to form a team. In this case, the hunter who was planning to undertake a long journey during winter would have to ask for animals on a loan, usually from his relatives. No payment was required, but it was implied that the dogs and the equipment should return in good condition. Dogs could also be bought and sold, but it seems that this happened rarely as there was such an aversion to selling or exchanging such animals. Dogs developed a strong bond with their owner and the other members of the group, and it often happened that a sold dog would run away from its new master to return to its original owner, even traveling a very long distance to do so. For this reason, puppies were the object of exchange. The lead dog, on the other hand, due to the importance of its role and the effort put into its training, was never sold. Dogs could be considered hereditary property. Upon the death of the owner, the spouse was the first person to have ownership rights over the dogs. Unless the deceased was young and unmarried, then the right would pass to the parents or siblings. In the event that the spouse was unable to care for the animals due to illness or old age, dogs would be inherited by the children and their families. On the other hand, if their heir was too young, it was customary that another family member would take care of the dogs until they developed the necessary skills to care for the animals by themselves. The management of a pack of dogs was considered dangerous work at all times, and young people were not allowed to go out sledding alone until they were deemed ready. Children, especially boys, were taught how to approach dogs and how to care for them as early as age 5 or 6, but never without supervision of an adult. Only in their middle or late teens were they given some responsibility and the possibility of using some of their parents' dogs. Over time, a young man could begin to consider the dogs as his own by virtue of contributing to their maintenance and by demonstrating his abilities. But only after leaving the parental home due to marriage, the young man would acquire formally the ownership of the animals. At the same time, assumed joint responsibility was brought to the bride. Such rules were not fixed and could vary according to the needs and economic well-being of the families involved. Finally, dogs were the subject of customs and regulations that today we might consider laws. If a dog barked too much, bothered children, or bit someone, the owner could be required to take action and keep the animal tied up. If the transgression was repeated, the dog could be killed freely. Such action could have serious repercussions, as we will see later, but if the owner had been previously warned without doing anything about it, the killing could be carried out with impunity. 
Despite what has been said so far, Inuit attitudes towards dogs were not entirely mechanistic. Although sporadically it was possible to witness small displays of affection of people towards their animals, it was not common for a family of an individual to have a favorite dog, which received preferential treatment compared to the others. However, at its death it was not common to show particular sorrow, apart from children who were allowed to cry. Demonstrations of affection towards the pups were much more common and encouraged. In contrast, it often happened that men and women expressed their frustrations on their animals, beating them or yelling at them. To this day, many are aware that dogs can act as a psychological release valve. The spur of anger could be caused by the bad behavior of one or more animals, usually during a sledding trip. But any reason, no matter how small, could be used to justify a manifestation of anger. The most common method of punishing dogs was the use of the whip, or a stick if the latter wasn't available. It was well known that such instruments were to be used in moderation and only after having learning how to use them properly. Otherwise, they would make the animals unable to work because of the excessive fear of being beaten. The ability to vent one's anger on dogs could, however, influence social relations among the people in the community. The social importance of dogs also lied on the fact that they allowed their owners to learn to control their own anger on dogs rather than in expressing it on people. In the Inuit's view, the behavior of a dog often reflected the personal characteristics and qualities of the owner. If a man was rough, gruff, and mean, his dogs would be fierce and aggressive towards people. On the contrary, a quiet and industrious person would have tame and hard-working dogs. For this reason, dogs offered an excellent means of expressing egotism. Men boasted greatly about the speed and stamina of their animals, and rather than claiming to be better than someone else which could generate resentment, a person could declare that his dogs were superior to those of others. The cultures of Arctic and subarctic environments share a view of the world as a place rich in spiritual power and full of entities that can take different shapes, transform, and engage with humans influencing them to even be able to determine the ability of people to hunt and fish successfully. It is a world made of persons. In Western cultures, the term person is generally reserved for human entities. But for Arctic societies, it can also be attributed to plants, objects, atmospheric phenomena, landscapes, and especially animals. All of these are sentient beings endowed with intentionality, and their spirit is destined to cyclically incarnate into new individuals. In such a system, humans and non-human persons are gifted with intelligence and individuality. They form groups, they have parallel social lives that mirror one another, and they can cross the human-non-human -human boundary to marry and have children. The basic premise of this cosmology lies in the fact that all people are inexorably engaged in a complex communicative interrelationship, and that being successful in life requires an active maintenance of the harmony among these relationships, especially between human and animal people and between humans themselves. Calling an animal a non-human person emphasizes the relationship it has with human society and for a population that depends almost entirely on animal-derived products for survival, this worldview takes on particular significance. For the Inuit specifically, everything that exists is endowed with Inua. This is a vital force or spirit that contributes to life, to the maintenance of harmony, and to procreation. This term, formed using the root inu, meaning person, and the grammatical affix a, indicating possession, literally translates to one's person, and is generally used to refer to the master or owner of something. Every animal possesses an inua that it shares with all other members of its species, and this collective inua may reside in a place or correspond to a deity. The inua of the caribou, for example, dwells in a large cave. And that of the marine mammals coincides with the mythological goddess Sedna, who lives in the depths of the sea. To be human is to possess an Inua, and that is why, according to certain populations, the Inua can manifest as a man or a woman. Some tales tell of places where animals live in the form of humans, or of circumstances in which animals talk to humans by pulling back the skin of their snouts and showing a human face. The Inua is the master of the animal and is the thing that allows it to act independently and make its own choices. 
This allows the animals to decide to give themselves up to hunters and thus allow human survival. The Inuit recognize the cruciality of such decisions by the non-humans and therefore have great respect for them, which they demonstrate by enacting special practices from the time the animal is killed to the moment that its body is consumed. Hence the relationship between hunter and hunted becomes one reciprocity, in which the animal gives itself to man so that he may feed on its flesh and the man in return works so that the spirit of the hunted can incarnate into a new being diligently respecting the taboos called tiragususit, and thus ensuring that no offense is caused to the spirit of the killed animal at times of hunting, slaughtering, and consumption. It is absolutely crucial to respect these taboos because if the spirits feel insulted, they may not decide to reincarnate or may convince its fellows to stop giving themselves to the humans and disappear. Jeopardizing the survival of the Inuit as a whole the peculiarity of the dog lies in the fact that it is considered to be the only animal without a spirit. For them, there is neither a master deity nor a place to live in a human form. Dogs, like other animals and like humans, are endowed with a summa, which is the ability to reason and to be aware of the world around them. But unlike of these, they do not possess the faculty to make decisions freely. In fact, since they are owned by humans and therefore they are not the masters of themselves, Dogs are the only ones who are not endowed with Inua. In other words, the spirit of the dog is the man's soul, which controls the animal from the outside. Men and dogs not only coexist in the same space, share the same food, and cooperate in travel and hunting, the dog and its master are one and whole. Since the Inua of the dog is its master, there is no need to worry about the survival of its species. Therefore, there are no cultural norms regulating post-mortem treatment for these animals. The Inuit do not hold ceremonies or rituals for the death of their dogs, and as we've seen before, they don't seem to be particularly grieved by it, showing in most cases a certain indifference. At the same time, however, dogs have the name called Attic, and this places them in a privileged position compared to other animals. The concepts of name and spirit are closely related in Inuit culture. The notion of the soul is not particularly clear, but many scholars agree that, according to the Inuit, at the individual level, every human is endowed with three immaterial components. Beyond the Asuma, Anirnik, the life breath, Tarnik, the man-shaped shadow, and Atik, the name. The Anirnik is possessed by all living beings because it represents the act of breathing, which ceases to exist with the death of an individual. The Tarnik is a sort of shadow or reflection of the individual that only humans and supernatural beings possess. The most common idea about the Tarnik is that it survives the death of the body, and depending on the life conduct and conditions of the person's death, it migrates to one of three afterlives located in the sky, under the earth, and in the depths of the sea. Finally, Attic is the part of the spirit that after death wanders the world of the living and can, in a sense, reincarnate by being absorbed through the practice of naming. A recently deceased person might manifest themselves in the dreams of soon-to-be parents and expresses his desire to live again through their Attic in the body of a newborn child. In doing so, the donor maintains their social relations with the living. The vessel of the name spirit will be perceived and consequently treated as the person whose name it bears, acquiring their social identity, tastes, and abilities. For example, a boy with the attic of his paternal grandmother will be called Anna, or mother, by his father, and Saki, mother-in-law, by his mother. He will also be raised as a female and be taught to sew, tan skins, and perform household chores, only to learn the typical male tasks with puberty. To appease the dead and as a good omen, it is essential that infants be given the right set of names following the appropriate rituals. A person can thus possess many names and multiple souls may reside in it. The custom of name sharing called Saniric is well known and very common and the bond that is formed between homonyms is special. The attic of dogs is no different from that of men and by assigning a name to a dog, one recognizes it has individuality and a social identity. Dogs are given special names that are usually descriptive of appearance or character, and that come from a set of specific dog names that is handed down bilaterally. 
Each musher, which is the owner of a pack of sled dogs, has a favorite and unique set of names that he reserves for his current team and for future ones. However, it is not possible to come across a dog with a human name. It could happen, especially in the past and in the case of couples without children. But the name of a recently deceased loved one was assigned to a puppy. This allowed the animal, which by its nature is without Inua, to host a spirit. In this case, just as Inuit would do with humans, they referred to the dog as the person whose name it bore. Hence, the dog in question would receive special care, be fed better than others, and was allowed to live inside the house. Sometimes a dog would be named after a living person, but that could be ambiguous. On one hand, it could have been an affectionate way of feeling close to a distant loved one or a joking way of expressing friendship, but on the other hand, it could have been a practice frowned upon and a source of offense. For instance, an owner might have been given its own name to a dog that they were particularly attached to, but that would have been seen as a demonstration of weakness on their part. Equally, a dog detested for its bad behavior could have been given the name of an enemy, so that treating the animal badly, it was hoped that its namesake would also suffer. At the same time, it was possible, though very rare, for a human to be given the same name of a dog. These were mainly magical contexts related to healing from disease or from the influence of evil spirits. If a couple had a series of children who died at birth or soon after, the Ngakuk, the Inuit shaman or medicine man, could decide to give the last born a dog name to break the sequence of unfortunate names so the child would live. It is important to point out that all these practices related to dog naming, while not common in the past and even less so in the present, are still well known and they testify to the symbolic interaction of the dog in human society. So where does the dog fit in Inuit cosmology? The classification of the dog is a rather ambiguous subject. It possesses an Attic, but not an Inua, and by being the only animal to have undergone the process of domestication in the North American Arctic, it is not considered equal to others. The difference lies in the subordinate relationship that the dog has towards human, meaning that its domestic nature entails the concepts of ownership, control, and domination that are alien to wild animals. In his 1994 article, From Trust to Domination, An Alternative History of Human-Animal Relations, Tim Ingold uses the relationship between humans and animals to distinguish pastoral peoples from hunter-gatherers. In his view, domestication imposes animals to be seen as objects and thus properties of humans as opposed to them being seen as equals by hunter-gatherer societies. This distinction, however, does not account for the fact that some hunter-gatherer peoples do have animals as pets, just like the case of the Inuit and sled dogs. There is no doubt that the relationship between the two species is one of domination. The dog is dependent on humans for its nourishment to a greater extent than he is towards it. It obeys orders imposed by the master or is punished when it doesn't. Tools are used on it that restrict its movement, such as harnesses, ropes, collars, and so on. According to Ingold, dogs, not having the freedom to choose and act independently, cannot enjoy the same trust that humans have with wild animals. At the same time, however, unlike wild animals, dogs inspire a sense of loyalty and reliability in men. They must in fact establish a close bond with their dogs to carry out their activities in safety and peace of mind. And they must be able to rely on them in cases when they are unable to make decisions on their own, such as in the event of snowstorms. There is a level of intimacy in the relationship between dog and man that allows the former to be much more closer to the latter than he is with non-dominated animals. Being extremely close to man, but still not the same level, the dog thus seems to oscillate between the two realms the human and the animal realm, making its classification complicated and confusing. The cultural world of the Inuit is built on the basis of binary oppositions such as summer versus winter, land versus sea, sun versus moon, man versus woman, and so on. All animals fall into this categorization through the division between earth dwellers, imarmiutet, those who walk, bisutit, and those who fly, timiat, those who don't breathe air, equalit, and those who stick their heads out of the water to breathe, pujit. 
All these groups fall under the set named Umajit, literally he who lives, which can be compared to what Western science calls the animal kingdom. Interestingly enough, dogs do not belong in any of these groups. They are certainly considered a living being and their resemblance to other members of the group is recognized, but due to the intimate relationship they have with men, backed by the mythology that states that the two species came to the world together, they occupy a separate and distinct sphere from all other animals that they share only with humans and body lice, another animal with a very close relation to men. Dogs are therefore considered mediators between nature and culture, a liminal figure perpetually suspended between two worlds. This view is reinforced by the space they occupied in the physical world. In the past, dogs were allowed to roam freely in the surrounding area of the camp and they were not allowed to enter the home. But on special occasions, as we previously saw, they were allowed to shelter inside the house and their designated space was the atrium. Here the dogs act as a mediator between the inside and the outside of the house. Similarly, dogs accompanied men on their hunting trips transporting them from their home to the ice flow, performing as an intermediary figure between the land and the sea, between the home and the hunting ground, and between human society and the animal world. The physical position of the dog naturally translated into a spiritual one. The proximity of the animal to the entrance of the house meant that its inhabitants could be readily alerted of the presence of malicious spirits that only a dog can sense. Dogs could also offer protection from invisible dangers in other ways as well. An evil aura could be warded off by throwing dog excrement and urine at it, or an ominous astral conjunction could be alerted by pinching a dog's ears, causing them to yelp. The dog was also considered by many Inuit populations to be an intermediary between life and death because of the tales that feature it. The most famous is surely the myth of the dog husband, found in several variations across the Arctic and featuring a girl who, angry at her father for the husband he had chosen for her, marries her dog and runs away from home. In some versions, the young woman gives birth to pups, children, or hybrids who later become the ancestors of the natives of the Algonquian and Athabascan languages and of white men. In other versions, the dog husband is killed by the girl's father and upon drowning in the sea, he becomes the guardian of the entrance to the realm of the dead known as Aldevan. Some myths place dogs at the beginning of life, describing the first conception of man as a dog entering an igloo and vomiting white food. The representation of the father's reproductive organ as a dog is also present in several interviews from the 70s. The spiritual position of the dog at the beginning and end of human life is also expressed by certain practices that in the past were enacted at births and funerals. Among some populations, such as the Inuit of northern Alaska, birth took place in a specially constructed shelter whose perimeter was covered with dog feces conveniently collected by the husband. In others, as with the Baffin Islanders, after a period of mourning lasting three days in which the dogs were not allowed to pull sleds, frequent hunting grounds, and eat, the animals were allowed to break into the deceased dwelling and feed on his possessions and sometimes even his corpse. Their droppings were subsequently placed around the house, which was then abandoned forever, representing the end of the cycle of life and death. The existence of the dog is thus extremely ambiguous, and its role as an intermediary between opposite worlds may have been the cause of its being the subject and object of various taboos. For some, the characteristic indeterminacy of the dog was a symptom of impurity and the animal was therefore to be treated the same as other subject or sacred interdictions. Contributing to this view are the animal's eating and sexual habits, which for some Inuit populations were sufficient to not consider it an equal partner. The Yupik of Alaska, for example, saw dogs as dirty, disgusting, and immoral creatures. These, in fact, at least until the sedentarization of the population, acted as scavengers within the community in which they lived, feeding on mainly hunting waste and sometimes animal and human excrement, as well as corpses. Likewise, their sexual promiscuity and the publicity of their mating were despised behaviors. Despite the fact that many Inuit populations were relatively liberal about matters of sex. For these reasons, the essence of the dog was considered impure and offensive to animals of prey and therefore great care was taken to ensure that they did not come into contact with specific parts of hunted animals. 
For some populations, it was forbidden to feed the dog the game's head, for others the bladder or even the bones as it was believed that the Inua dwelled in these organs. Oftentimes, for the most important prey such as caribou, seal, and especially whale, the prohibitions covered all parts of the body, and more. The populations that practiced whaling, for instance, had built around it a veritable cult complete with songs, rituals, and prayers designed to convince the animal to give itself to men. For this reason, it was absolutely forbidden for dogs to participate in whale hunting, as their mere presence on the ice flow would have been an insult to the prey. They were also prohibited to feed on any part of the hunted animal or even to come into contact with it. If a dog had touched the bones of a whale, its owner could have lost its fortune in the hunt, fundamentally inflicting a death sentence on him. That's why the hunters did their best to safely dispose of the whale bones, carefully storing them away in secluded spots. In many places, the dog itself was a subject of food taboos. Among almost all Inuit peoples, a ban on eating dog meat existed, often accompanied by a prohibition on using their fur. Logically, this was most likely due to the important economic value of the animal rather than for spiritual or superstitious reasons. Yet the argument of some natives, such as those of Hudson Bay, would suggest otherwise. Their refusal to eat dog meat is based on the assumption that it looks and tastes too much like human flesh, and this opinion seemed to be widespread in other parts of the Arctic as well. Similarly, polar bear meat was forbidden for the same reason as bears were thought to resemble humans in many ways. A friend of mine out in Montana actually refuses to hunt bears because when you hang them up, their body looks too much like a human. It will therefore come as no surprise that in Inuit cosmology, bears are considered to be a partner of human beings in the animal world, just as dogs are considered to be the animal partner in human society. The consumption of such meats was especially prohibited to those who, under extreme conditions, had previously tasted human flesh because it was thought that the taste would keep their desire for the latter alive. Eating dog or bear meat was thus the first step towards cannibalism. Moreover, dog liver was considered poisonous, probably due to the massive presence of vitamin A in the organ, and had to be carefully avoided as its consumption would cause hair loss. Despite the existence of taboos, however, it was possible for dog meat to be eaten in situations of extreme food scarcity, but this practice was a last resort before turning to cannibalism. As is often the case for other societies, food and sexual symbolism are closely connected in Inuit culture. Throughout the Arctic, there are myths that tell of sexual relations between humans and dogs, as in the case of Dog Husband previously seen. But such a theme is not only part of legends, in the past, the act of copulating with a dog was considered common practice and there was no associated shame, so much so that it was performed even by the most respectable hunters. It was, however, necessary to follow specific rules. First, the dog had to be in heat because it was essential for natural instincts to be respected. Otherwise, one ran the risk of being punished by the spirits. At the same time, the act had to be performed outside and never indoors. The only possible shelter being under an umanek, a kind of naturally formed ice canopy. Even today, one can find abundant references to bestiality in places such as the archives of oral traditions, in Ugalik, and in the accounts of elders. But it should always be kept in mind that the majority of the accounts are almost entirely based on gossip, and it is therefore difficult to say with certainty whether such practices were really carried out to the extent described by ethnographic sources. Nonetheless, it is evident that this notion contributed importantly to the discourse on sexual relations. Dogs could be seen as social partners also because of their potential in being sexual partners. Another very controversial act in Inuit culture was to injure or kill a dog. Such measures were often taken if a specimen had posed a threat to the group, like in cases of serious disobedience, violence, food theft, or it had been unable to fulfill his obligations, like hunting or pulling the sled. There are several factors that contribute to inhibition in killing or injuring dogs, but perhaps the most important one is the fact that they possess names. In the past, humans could be killed without major problems if they had not yet been given a name. But once they were named, the killing was no longer allowed since a relationship with namesakes now existed. For dogs, the same rule applied. As any action against the animal would be equivalent to an action against the person bearing the same name. 
The killing of the dog could lead to revenge by the Tarnik of its namesake. Dog killings were therefore often ritualized. In Western Greenland, for example, an aged and battered dog could be killed by hanging just as it would have been done for humans in the case of assisted suicide. When an elderly person wished to end their life, in fact, their family could have assisted them by performing a killing by strangulation. Apparently this practice was not considered murder, therefore the Tarnik of the deceased would have not taken revenge. Other methods could have been used for dog suppression, like placing a pointed whalebone inside of a piece of blubber. But almost never was the dog killed by a rifle shot. The killing of pups could differ from that of adult dogs. The Hudson Bay natives dispose of unwanted puppies by leaving them behind in the snow, equally to how they would have done in the case of infanticide, thus delegating their suppression to nature. Similarly, in Greenland, the task was assigned to children, and adults found the job too revolting to do it themselves. As previously mentioned, no particular cultural norms existed that regulated the treatment of dogs post-mortem other than abandoning the carcass at the place where the animal died and occasionally placing stones on it. There were, however, situations in which dog burial was expected. The most common was the entombment of particular beloved dogs together with their owner, a very ancient custom identifiable in the archaeological record. Another tradition of Greenlandic origin involved burying a dog's head along with a deceased child, so that the animal would guide it to the land of the dead. Killing a dog, as much as it might arouse aversion, was therefore acceptable as long as it took place under the proper circumstances. Outside these contexts, the killing of a dog could cause upset in its owners. For example, among the Inuit of northern Alaska, it was said that the first step for a person who wanted to start a conflict would be to kill an enemy's dog. This would publicly expose the dispute and could lead to bloodshed, starting a feud. The most relevant example, however, is the massacre of dogs in Nunavik between 1950 and 1960 perpetuated by the officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. This event, which we will discuss later, deeply hurt the Inuit and more than 50 years later, those who have lost dogs or witnessed their slaughter describe the incident as traumatic and a real attack against them and their culture. Regarding the act of injuring a dog, the only practice that seemed to have been generally accepted was mutilation for the purpose of improving the quality of the animal. Such amputations were performed on puppies, the most common one being the docking of the tail, which was believed to make dogs faster or less lazy. The infliction of wounds that cause bleeding was also fairly common with the purpose of making the animals more alert, as well as the removal of the carnassial teeth, to prevent them from biting their own harness. Many Inuit populations believed in the existence of a connection between the health of a human and that of their dog. That's why the mutilation or killing of a dog could also take place for reasons related to healing. As we've already seen, men, being the Inuit of their dogs, form a whole with their animals, thus recognizing the intimacy of the relationship as a physical unity. In a similar way, diseases are perceived as the disintegration of a whole. The bond between the body and the tarnik of a person is very fragile, and as soon as the tarnik moves away, the person becomes ill and may even die if it doesn't return. Angering the Inua of prey or the spirits of the dead by transgressing ritual interdictions may also have caused illness. In both of these cases, a restoration of relationships becomes necessary, and the first step to achieving this is usually to confess to one's disobedience in the presence of a shaman. Only with the reconciliation between people in the community or between people and spirits could healing be successful. Following this logic, the reintegration of the tarnik with the body, the restoration of relationships, and consequently the eradication of the disease are equivalent to regaining the wholeness. Many Inuit believed that one of the best ways to do so would be to mutilate or kill a sick person's dog, sacrificing it as a substitute for its master. The general idea coincided with the fact that once a disease had made its way within a family, it would have been better for it to be contracted by a dog rather than by a human as this belief was so well established in some Inuit communities. It is the same reason why that in some modern Inuit communities, people still own at least one dog. The notion of sacrifice, however, does not belong to Inuit culture and therefore cannot be used to explain such killings. 
Instead, healing through canicide was considered possible thanks to the intimate relationship between the dog and its human, which allows for a transfer of relationships. By killing or destroying parts of the dog, the others, which are enemies or spirits, assume that the sick person is already dead and therefore it is not necessary to continue their work. The master survives his dog just as the innuo of the animal survives their death. The main way in which dog killing was performed in this context was by exsanguination. Through stabbing or mutilation, a division between the blood or body parts and the body took place. A separation between the human and his dog was thus required for the healing process. Through the manipulation of the part-whole relationship, it is possible to effect a transfer of relationships and characteristics between the individuals involved. In this way, one can also justify other practices of a healing nature involving dogs, such as the use of their urine, feces, or saliva. The animal's fluid and droppings could be ingested, rubbed on the body, or mixed with food to achieve beneficial effects such as healing a wound, promoting the healthy growth of a child, the pacification of a soul, and even rejuvenation. After performing such practices, it was expected that the dog would be thanked, for example, gifting it a beautiful leather collar. Even the name of the dogs could be employed to regain health. Anthropologist Franz Boas reported the custom whereby the shaman could change the name of a sick person into a dog name so that it would act as an amulet to ward off disease. The sick person was thus consecrated as a dog to the goddess Sedna and had to wear a dog's harness under their jacket for the rest of their life. Through these operations, the patient would take on characteristics of a dog and thus the spirits would not bring them any harm. For the same reason, tradition has it that a dangerous dog who had bitten a human would go unpunished until the person had completely recovered. The convalescence of an individual and the welfare of the animal are closely connected, and the culling of the dog before its completion could result in the death of a patient. If society was afflicted by some evil, it was always desirable that the dogs die first. And if a human being got sick, it was much better for their dog to sacrifice some of its parts for the master's health or to suffer and die in their place. The dog thus functions as a pars pro toto. With the destruction of a part, the whole is restored or even improved. Illness could also be seen as an unwanted conjunction with death and healing from it required rituals that separated the person from the disease and the death that might seize them. Therefore, when the division between life and death is at risk and a human life is weak, the dog, with its role as a mediator always bordering between two worlds, must be broken down into parts. Through this action, the separation between life and death is settled and the sick human can regain his health. The disjunction between the patient and the socio-cosmic order of which he is a part is replaced by that between the dog and his blood and by extension between the dog and his master. Only in this way the person can re-establish the relationship with the community and with the spirits. This procedure can only be effective because of the close relationship between the individuals involved and the destruction of the parts is the only way to save the whole. In conclusion, killing the dog in all cases is the last resort, both for the individual and for the community, but can mean a transition from a state of despair to a new life. It constitutes a category of transition and in ritual terms appears wherever boundaries between distinct categories might collapse. The dog therefore provides the remedies to prevent collapse and preserve the separation of categories. The Arctic landscape and wildlife population began to undergo changes with the arrival of Scottish whaling fleets in the 1840s. These foreigners, amazed at the Inuit's ability to survive in such a hostile environment, began to exchange knowledge and goods with them to make the most of the Arctic environment. The Inuit were then introduced to the use of guns, steel harpoons, and nets, altering the importance and ways in which dogs had been used up until that point. The new technologies in fact made it easier to obtain food, but at the same time, the new trade with Europeans required a greater amount of labor over a large area to meet the growing demands for hides. With the decline of whaling in the following decades and the rise in popularity of fox fur, the need for more sled dogs increased and the amount of animals per team doubled or tripled throughout most of the Arctic. In the late 1940s, the Canadian government reinforced some regulations previously instituted to limit the hunting of caribou by the Inuit. 
It was argued that the excessive size of sled dog teams and therefore the larger amount of food needed to maintain them was one of the main reasons why the number of caribou was declining. The redistribution of game and the limitation in hunting it along with the crisis in the trade of the now unfashionable fox fur entailed substantial changes in Inuit life, introducing above all sedentarization. The difficulty of sustaining themselves through hunting led the majority of the population to migrate to settlements where military bases and government infrastructure was present, making it possible to find paid work in fields such as transportation, construction, maintenance, etc. At the same time, precisely in 1949, the federal government established a network of small schools scattered throughout the territory of Nudovic which demanded daytime attendance, thus encouraging families to settle in the communities where the schools were located, as opposed to the residential school model that requires continuous attendance throughout the year and was generally most widely used to address native schooling. Families were also awarded a monetary incentive from the federal government of Canada to ease the transition to sedentarism, on the condition that their children were sent to school. Similar measures and initiatives were also taken at the same time by the governments of the United States and Denmark for the territories of Alaska and Greenland, respectively. The common goal was to regroup the population to improve their health and education and consequently optimize control over the Arctic territory. In the words of anthropologist Francique Bailan Truba, in the span of a decade between the 1950s and 1960s, the Inuit found themselves moving from the Stone Age to the Space Age. Sedentarization, however, did not automatically lead to a transformation of culture. The Inuit who moved into these emerging communities brought with them their dogs as well, maintaining the customs and habits of camp life. Just like before, Dogs were allowed to freely roam the community in order to independently scavenge for food. But now, the number of dogs was far greater than that found in the average camp. This situation generated several problems for public authorities stationed in new Arctic settlements. Sometimes the dogs were responsible for killing sheep and other livestock, fatally wounding children, and causing the outbreak of some epidemics. For the federal government, which had remained virtually absent from the Arctic up until that point, Regulating sled dogs for maintaining the health and safety of the inhabitants of the Great North became a matter of utmost urgency. On January 20th, 1949, a decree entitled An Ordinance Respecting Dogs was enacted, which repelled the previous legislation concerning dogs in the Northwest Territories and prohibited owners from letting their animals loose around the settlements. The law also gave local authorities the power to seize dogs from offenders and specify the conditions for returning the animal to its owner. If this did not happen within five days, the authorities would have the right to sell the animal, therefore introducing the concept of the dog as a commodity. Additionally, the ordinance allowed officers to terminate seized animals, for reasons of public health or safety and at any time after abduction and prescribed a fine of up to $25 or short imprisonment for any violator. The new legislation was initially met with indifference by the Inuit as the language barrier prevented them from understanding it. Indeed, the ordinance was not translated into their language or made publicly available. And most of the officers charged with enforcing it did not speak their language either, and this caused the effect of great hostility whenever it was enforced. The presence of dogs at large in the settlements generated not only conflicts between the Inuit and the white men, but also within the Inuit communities themselves. The animals destroyed food supplies and happened to attack Inuit children. The reluctance of many natives to keep dogs tethered resided mainly in the fact that the animals left free to feed independently were strong and ready for work whereas those kept on chains and fed on dog food were thin. Actively maintaining a healthy and strong team also required considerable physical effort and time expenditure things that most Inuit at the time could not afford. The 1950s and 1960s saw the outbreak of numerous canine epidemics, the worst of which were infectious hepatitis and distemper, which led to the death or killing of hundreds of dogs throughout the Arctic. The fear of rabies, a viral disease that can be spread by dogs and infect humans and cause death, greatly increased intolerance towards these animals, which were being killed more and more arbitrarily. 
The culling of dogs started to be performed without permission or even consultation with the owners who perceived such killings as a direct attack on their families, causing a cultural scar that is still present today. Elders refer to this series of events as Kumi Jack Tonic, which means being deprived of one's dog repeatedly, but it is difficult to find anyone to talk about it willingly as the incident is still remembered with pain and felt as an injustice. Since the government did not want the Inuit to become dependent on government subsidies, the traditional lifestyle based on hunting and travel was encouraged for as long as possible. But once the dog population was driven to near extinction, this was no longer possible. Populations for whom dogs were essential found themselves at risk of starvation, forcing the Arctic administration to evacuate several groups from their ancestral lands and relocate them in permanent settlements. Such relocation, however, were carried out forcibly and without warning or explanation to the Inuit, who once again experienced the event traumatically and regarded it as an abuse of power. The natives displaced in the settlements had been deprived of their land and their means of livelihood, and the snowmobile which had recently been introduced was not yet widespread and thus was not seen as a viable substitute for sled dogs. Being transferred to permanent colonies with no means of return to familiar hunting grounds left the Inuit vulnerable and dependent on their institutions. Up until the early 2000s, the injustice that the Inuit went through went unnoticed in the eyes of mass information. Those who took part in it denied any abuse and injustice, and those who were victims of it felt reluctant to talk about it. Eventually, with the creation of the Quiktani Truth Commission, Several investigations collected testimonies and promoted initiatives for the awareness of the events surrounding the Quimit Massacre. The result was an official apology from the Canadian federal government and the disbursement of 20 million Canadian dollars intended to fund cultural activities and programs of language and territorial revitalization. The spread of snowmobiles in the late 1960s, together with the devaluation of hunting products on the market and the increasing need for wage labor, represented a major cultural change for the Inuit, who hunted less and less. Thanks to the snowmobile, the new generations could now cover in a day the same distance for which a pack of dogs would take three. The ability to spend less time on the road had reduced the necessity to build igloo or to intimately know the terrain therefore changing people's attitude toward nature from one of knowledge and respect to one of domination. In some communities, the sled dog was completely replaced by the snowmobile while in others it continued to live alongside it. The role of the Kimmick in contemporary society is, however, considerably different from that of the pre-sedentarization period. Hunting and fishing are more commonly carried out on a large scale with the help of tools that make such activities less dangerous, thus considerably decreasing the need for people to obtain food independently. Like any other society, the Inuit are therefore acquiring a more comfortable and less risky lifestyle, and as a result, even dogs are no longer required to have skills that were previously essential, such as finding seal breathing holes or fighting polar bears. Today's dogs undergo a different type of training and an amount of exercise that is different, hardly comparable to the performance of the past. They also tend to differ morphologically, tending to be smaller but faster. Contemporary Inuit no longer own dogs just to use them as working animals. Some keep dogs for companionship and to have someone to dispose of the family's food waste. Some use them to protect themselves against wild animals, evil spirits, and disease, or even just for fun. Many own a dog team to escape everyday life, get out of the village, and experience the silence of the tundra. The presence of the Kwimit is no longer linked to subsistence activities, but mainly to cultural activities. The dog is part of the cultural identity of the people of the Arctic, and for new generations, it represents the link with their past and their traditions. Many Inuit argue that traveling on a dog sled allows them to connect with their own ancestors and see the land through their eyes, regaining a relationship with the environment that the speed of snowmobiling had caused them to lose. In recent decades, there has been a new use of dogs, sled racing. To this day, competitions are held annually and have become the most important and significant of the winter or spring season for the entire community. People from different settlements come together to determine who is the best musher in the region, 
but also, and most importantly, to meet with friends and families, have fun and socialize. Given that sled hunting is now practiced full time by only a few professionals, new generations tend to own dogs only for recreational activities or for providing an alternative monetary gain such as cultural tourism. This type of tourism provides an excellent way to combine economic benefits with the preservation of local values and recognition of that heritage by the industry can lead to a revitalization of cultural practices that can, however, be given new meanings. Climate change affects Arctic areas in a very visible and increasingly problematic way for local populations. The traditional way of life, progressively influenced by globalization, has lately also been affected by the increasingly evident climate change. The sea ice thaws earlier every year, therefore reducing the hunting and fishing period. The result is a forced decrease in the use of sled dogs for traditional activities and the gradual abandonment of their breeding. In Greenland, the Quimmit population has dropped from about 25,000 to less than 15,000 within 20 years. This has led many organizations to launch traditional lifestyle conservation products that include the art of dog management and sledding. Older generations fear that these practices may disappear due to the sharp decline in the number of mushers. But they hope that future generations will continue with as many traditional practices as possible. They argue that the importance of knowing how to drive a sled and handle dogs lies in the fact that the future holds economic uncertainty. In such a hostile environment in which expensive and non-local technologies force people to depend on the outside, it is important to have alternatives. In fact, some families keep dogs in case something happens. Children and teens are encouraged to learn about their traditions and grow interest in these practices as a means to develop a sense of security and independence. Inuit have always relied on their dogs for hunting and for travel. In the past, they helped the hunter track or bring down prey and travel great distances. Dogs carried great weights, warned people in case of danger, and in times of extreme need, their meat could save humans from starvation and their fur from the cold. They were thus considered non-human people, and an integral part of the society of humans. Like them, in fact, they had a name that could evoke relationships among humans and, like them, were subject to ritual interdictions. As animal partners of humans, they were considered potential sexual partners as well as possible food sources. But the exploitation of animals in either way was considered controversial and ambiguous. In cosmological terms, they could be found at the beginning and the end of life as shamans and could sense the presence of spirits. The relationship with humans, however, remains one of subordination and not one of reciprocity as the latter control every aspect of the lives of the animals, from feeding to reproduction. Over the past 60 years, the Inuit have shifted from a world imbued with rituals, social relations, and spirituality to one made up of economic, impersonal, and secular relationships. The replacement of the sled dog with a snowmobile was of particular significance. Placed in the context with relations with a Western, colonizing, and capitalistic culture, this transition explains why the fate of the Inuit sled dogs is so important, and why many native people have made the fate of the Quimit one of the most central concerns of initiatives for the preservation and revitalization of their culture. Despite the modernization of the Inuit way of life, the sled dog remains culturally significant. A symbol of an identity that has faded but not lost, and that seeks its own confirmation from the recovery of its own cultural roots. Thanks for watching this installment of North O2. I hope you appreciated the pure depth of this video as much as I did. This video was actually written as a thesis paper, originally in Italian by Ariana Verdecchia. It is hard for me to keep up with video production considering I am in my senior year of university, so I plan to commission more scripts in the future. This will also be a great way to improve my output. I promise the quality of the videos will stay the same, if not improve. Thanks for your time leave a comment, and maybe subscribe if you haven't already. This has been your host, North02, and I can't wait to see you on the next one. Arrivederci.